Hey everyone, good evening. Welcome to the Whitney. My name's Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's program. What is cryptocurrency for artists, writers, the incarcerated, and anyone else too afraid or embarrassed to ask with Badlands Unlimited, or I should say presented by Badlands Unlimited. Um, since I count myself among those needing a crypto primer, I'm going to leave any further discussion of this topic to tonight's speakers. Um, but I just wanted to say that tonight's program is organized in conjunction with the exhibition An Incomplete History of Protest, which is currently on view on the sixth floor here at the Whitney, and we're open until 10 tonight, if you haven't yet seen it. Um, the show looks at how artists from the 1940s to the present have confronted the political and social issues of their day, um, and it's all drawn from the Whitney's collection. And whether making art as a form of activism, criticism, instruction, or inspiration, the featured artists see their work as essential to challenging established thought and creating a more equitable culture. Badlands Unlimited is one of those artists. The exhibition includes their new nose, a manifesto, a poem, and a poster that acts as a declaration against the drift of American society towards what is most un-American. No to racists, no to fascists, no to taxes funding racists and fascists. It's actually a great mantra. Um, so for tonight's program, Badlands wanted to share their ongoing work around cryptocurrency and how it might be a tool for both, creative, for both creativity and social justice. Um, before I turn things over to Paul Chan, the founder of Badlands Unlimited, um, because tonight's program is about value, currency, transactions, money, um, I just want to acknowledge that we are here tonight on unceded indigenous lands, the worst real estate deal ever, um, specifically the territory of the Lenni Lenape. Because the Whitney is a Museum of American Art, I would like this recognition to remind us of the continuing legacy of settler colonialism in the United States and of all the amazing work that is being done right now to actively dismantle its effects. Thank you so much for being here. Please welcome Paul Chan. Hi, um, I am Paul Chan, publisher of Badlands Unlimited. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I want to thank Megan Howard and uh, Christine Sandoval Howard of the Whitney uh, for hosting tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Badlands Crypto Group for being here, who will be on stage soon. And uh, did I thank you already? OK, I think I did. Um, when Megan approached us to do an uh, uh, event, we thought, why not do it on cryptocurrency? And, uh, and so the first thought is, for anyone, I think, is why would, uh, why would an art book publisher in New York be interested in cryptocurrency? I think the basic answer is, last year, everyone and their mother was interested in cryptocurrency uh, because headlines were being made about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, and other cryptocurrencies all of last year. Um, but the second reason why we would be interested in it is because Badlands Unlimited, as an independent art book publisher that was established in New York in 2010, um, got involved into, into um, Bitcoin in 2011. We uh, started working with Bitcoin in um, July of 2011. We were the, arguably the first, I think we are the first, art book publisher to uh, allow Bitcoin payments for our books and works at the New York Art Book Fair in 2011. Exactly one person asked us about that at the Art Book Fair at MoMA PS1. And we've been working on and off with crypto since 2011. And, you know, and I think our interests have waxed and waned until, of course, last year. And last year was the first year where people actually bought our books and works in crypto, in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it was then that we decided to start the Badlands Crypto Group, where we would gather um, people in the arts and publishing uh, and who had a like-minded interest in crypto to just talk about it, share information, and uh, just to hang out and maybe just drink. 
And uh, so we did in the fall of 2017. And uh, we started doing informal presentations for artists and writers, letting them know about our experience in crypto, the risks and benefits, the technical history, the social history, what we think was important about understanding this very nascent technology and this developing fintech. And so tonight, what I'm going to present to you is essentially our basic primer for artists and writers about what crypto is, what it is not, its social and tech history, and some basic practicals about it. Um, it is not a Code Academy course. Um, we won't be talking about Python or any kind of programming language. This is certainly not a trading uh, lecture. I, we won't be telling you about what you should trade, what you should buy or sell in terms of crypto. You can ask other people about that maybe after, like Miriam. Um, but it will be just a basic primer for people who are too embarrassed or afraid or just want to know what the hell this thing is. Uh, my presentation will take around 30, 35 minutes. And then after that, I'm going to introduce on stage two great uh, uh, artists and writers who have, one, I think, one of the most interesting crypto projects out there. Uh, Grayson Earl, an artist, and uh, Maya Bingham, uh, a writer and an editor, uh, are co-creators of a project called Bail Block, which combines cryptocurrency with, uh, with uh, the bail system in the United States, essentially using leveraging cryptocurrency to help get people uh, out of incarceration. It's completely fascinating, and I'm very happy that they're here to talk about it. So they'll talk about it, and then after that, we'll have a, hopefully a raucous Q&A with uh, the Badlands Crypto Group on stage, as well as uh, Maya and Grayson and whoever else we can invite on stage, I suppose. Cool. And also, uh, the, the pamphlets on um, the chair are uh, two Bitcoins. If you've touched them, um, please, I'm just kidding. It's just, it's like those subway scams. They're free, they're for you. And uh, thanks for coming. So let's start. Uh, I wanna start with a picture of Miriam Ketsoff's financial consultant. What is cryptocurrency? Very basic. What is cryptocurrency? It's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized electronic cash system of which Bitcoin or BTC at this point is most well known. When I say peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized, think Napster, think Torrance, think the Pirate Bay, think of file sharing networks that you're familiar with. As we talk in this lecture about cryptocurrency, you'll realize that technology is actually not cutting edge. It's just a synthesis of existing technologies that we're familiar with already. So with Bitcoin, it really is a file sharing network. Anyone who's shared MP3s over Napster, anyone who's ever done Pirate Bay with torrents, with um, movie files, or, uh, uh, or ebook files, or whatever JPEGs you share, um, you know how already how Bitcoin is sent, mm, in large part how Bitcoin works. It's peer-to-peer -peer decentralized system. When I say electronic cash, think Venmo, think PayPal, think USD, actually. Because USD is already, only less than 10% of uh, United States USD is actually in the physical form, either in paper or in coins. Most of our money in USD is already just electronic, right? Through your Visa, through your um, Venmo, through your PayPal. And so with electronic cash, just think Venmo or PayPal. Uh, and uh, uh, there will be other technologies involved in Bitcoin, but those are the two basic ones, peer-to-peer -peer decentralized and electronic cash system. The other part that's very important is the crypto part. Crypto um, is associated with cryptography, which is the science, art, and practice of securing communication, which we already know too, because whenever you buy things on Amazon, it uses cryptography to secure your transactions so that a third party cannot hack in and steal your card, steal your communication between you on your laptop or on your mobile phone and uh, Amazon servers and websites. Cryptography, it plays a large part in how Bitcoin developed and how all cryptocurrencies develop because cryptography is uh, the grounding for how transactions are secured as a currency. That's why it's called cryptocurrency. So how did Bitcoin begin? On October 31st, 2008, someone or some people by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto 
publishes a white paper entitled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system on the cryptography mailing list. Uh, on the cryptography mailing list, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who we still don't know who it is, uh, puts out a white paper that describes how Bitcoin uh, ought to work. This is the white paper. A white paper is essentially a general outline, quasi-scientific, that describes a process, scientific, technological, whatever. It's nine pages. I encourage anyone who's interested in Bitcoin to read it. It is technical, but it's not, it's not uh, painfully so. It is quite readable as a white paper, and it really does describe the basics of how Bitcoin works today uh, in a no-nonsense, uh, more or less non-jargony lingo. It's very well written, and it's only nine pages, and you can download it for free online. You can find it if you uh, search for it. Um, it was released on Halloween in 2008, which I think is nice. Uh, and this is the technical beginning of Bitcoin. Satoshi puts out the paper for people to read. What's important for Badlands and for the group is that there's also a political beginning to Bitcoin. And the political beginning of Bitcoin started essentially a month before, September 15th, 2008. On this newspaper from the Times of London, it's uh, listed September 16th because it's the next day. On September 16th, uh, Lehman Brothers uh, announced that they were, uh, uh, um, they were going bankrupt. Lehman Brothers was one of the largest, if not the largest, investment bank in America at the time. And uh, on September 15th slash 16th, they declared bankruptcy, heralding what is essentially the beginning of the great global recession. The Great Global Recession started, didn't start with uh, Lehman Brothers. AIG was in trouble. Goldman Sachs needed $500 million from Warren Buffett to stay alive as a business. The Great Recession started in 2008, September. $5 trillion in pension, real estate value, savings, and bonds disappeared. 8 million people lost their jobs. 6 million lost their homes. And this is only in the US, only. It's arguable that it's still happening. Uh, if, in fact, you count uh, stagnant and declining wages in the US, we're still in a recession. The great global recession of the 2008 was simply just one stop and the largest in a systematic failure of a monetary, uh, of a monetary scale that it arguably started in 1694. The great global recession wasn't a blip. It was a systematic failure. And the system which failed came from somewhere. And historically, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, count it back to 1694 at the founding of the Bank of England. It was the founding of the Bank of England that heralded the modern monetary system that all modern nation states use today, every one of them. The United States, Sweden, China, I'm not gonna name all the countries. It goes on and on. This is the monetary system that every nation, modern nation state uses. What is that model? This is the model. You can call it the three-headed dragon, three-headed monster. Um, the model starts with uh, the state. I'm gonna use my laser pointer. The state underwrites the money as legal store of value. In this case, it's the US federal government. Then you have the money system, which prints or otherwise creates money. In the United States, that's the Federal Reserve. They're the ones who print the money. Last is the banks, the commercial banks, which distributes money and keeps accounts of debtors and creditors. It is the relationship between these three elements that basically makes up the modern monetary system. It is how countries are run. And for this monetary system to work, there needs to be two basic things as the grounding for the system. And the two basic things are trust and third parties. The trust the system needs, because you need to trust that the state is going to do its thing. The money system is going to keep printing. It's, oh, gee, sorry. 
that the uh, money system is going to keep printing, and then the banks are going to credit and debit you uh, without cheating you, without engaging in fraud. Third parties are important because you have to trust these third parties, these intermediaries, for the, uh, your money uh, to work in any country. You have to trust that the banks are debiting, debiting or crediting you appropriately. You have to trust that the Federal Reserve is printing money at a rate that is uh, commensurate with inflation and any other elements. You have to trust that the state has your interest in mind when it develops monetary policy. But what if? What if? What if the state does not have your economic economic interests at heart? What if? What if the money system disenfranchises the poor and incentivizes profits above people or the rule of law? And what if banks serve their own needs above all others? What if? I know people are laughing. I know, what if? <laughs> the list in yellow are the other global recessions that we have gone through. We have gone through this before. 2008 was not the first one. It will not be the last. 2008 was real estate, along with deregulation. Uh, 1999, with Asian BRIC countries, was deregulation and global lending, which uh, led to uh, that recession. Uh, 1995 was real estate and deregulation. 1987 was luxury office and housing market and stocks. Uh, 1979, 82, OPEC, oil and real estate. 1974, oil, real estate. There are more. I didn't want to, I, didn't have, I didn't have room. I didn't have time. Sorry. Uh, 2008 was not the last one. We will have another one. We will have another one. Uh, Bitcoin bypasses the needs current monetary systems are built on. Trust and third parties. BTC is trustless and decentralized as a system. What does that mean? Trustless means Bitcoin does not rely on a third party like a bank to keep track of transactions. Um, uh, the ledger is continually and systematically updated and is transparent and open for anyone to see. Uh, arguably the heart of the Bitcoin system, what's called the blockchain. It's interesting that uh, Satoshi didn't even uh, use the word blockchain in the paper, in the white paper. It just kind of developed. Uh, but that's what people call it now, the blockchain. And the blockchain is essentially a ledger. And what is a ledger? It's just a file. Now, if you connect to what we've talked about with decentralized and peer-to-peer, -peer, just think about your experience pirating movies, like the new Avengers or the new Rihanna, um, on uh, Pirate Bay or other file sharing networks, you're pirating many different kinds of files. With Bitcoin, you're only sharing one file, and that file is the blockchain. And it's basically just a, leg a database file that holds every transaction that, Bit uh, that has ever taken place on the Bitcoin system since its beginning in 2008, 2009. The blockchain is just a giant file that we share, that anyone who participates in Bitcoin shares. Uh, the file physically right now is, I think, around 165 gigs. It's like smaller than like a movie. No, it's not. Sorry, I don't know. It's like 165 gigs. And anyone who participates in Bitcoin has the capacity, at, uh, at, um, the ability to read through the transactions, every transaction. Um, this is, by the way, not the actual file. This is just a f visual expression of the file. And so I like it. Oh, geez. I like it because it kind of, you can sort of visualize what kind of looks like. You can imagine that this is today, and the blockchain is being continually updated by transactions that's taken place. And so whenever you send a transaction from, let's say I send a transaction to Miriam or Grayson in the front, uh, it will record our addresses, it will record the amount, and it will record certain other data. And if it's a legitimate transaction, it will be recorded on a block, which then gets added to the blockchain. And once it's added on the blockchain, it is immutable. In programming lang lingo, uh, blockchain is amend only. You cannot modify it, you cannot reorder it. 
that is uh, the cruelty and the kind of innovation of the blockchain. That once it goes on the blockchain, it stays. It's just there. Decentralized. Anyone who takes part in Bitcoin can own a copy of that ledger, which is continually updated by the Bitcoin network. There is no central authority controlling the ledger or who can join the network. Anyone can participate. Anyone can come in and out of the network. Think file sharing networks like Napster and Torrents. I, I'm, a, I'm assuming that people have experience with file sharing networks and peer-to-peer -peer networks like Napster or the Pirate Bay. Is that a good assumption? Is that a bad assumption? Do people know what I'm talking about? More or less. I think th this is important because um, the reason why Bitcoin is, can be and is resilient is because if, if one node or one wallet goes down, it can uh, re-traffic it to another node. The resilience of peer-to-peer -peer networks is that it has no central server so that there's no one computer that can shut the network down. It is peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized. If wallets or miners or other computational participants shut down in Bitcoin, the network will systematically and automatically reroute it. That is the resilience uh, of Bitcoin, which combines um, fintech, financial technology, with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, networking. Timeline, um, just a quick timeline. Halloween 2008, Satoshi publishes his white paper, or someone publishes the white paper on the cryptograph, cryptography mailing list. January 3rd, 2009, Satoshi releases the actual code that he described in the white paper for anyone to use. Bitcoin is open source. May 22nd, next, the year after. The first recorded purchase made by Bitcoin. 10,000 Bitcoins for two large pizzas, which happened in Florida. Some guy on a forum says, I like two pizzas and I'm willing to pay 10,000 Bitcoins for it. I think a day later someone took him up, says okay. Uh, and he got it. He, got, he paid 10,000 Bitcoins for two large pizzas delivered in Florida. Zaslo, I believe, was his forum handle name. This is Badlands timeline. We started um, in Bitcoin on July 17th, 2011. I even know the time because it's on the blockchain. I can look it up. I can look up the transaction history of what we have. September 29th, 2011, we were the first publisher at the New York Art Book Fair to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. Again, one person asked us. I don't even remember what they asked. I think they thought maybe we spelled Bitcoin wrong on our sign. I don't remember. Last year, September 23rd, 2017, uh, we made our first crypto sales at the New York Art Book Fair, both in Bitcoin and in th Ethereum. So the question is, why? Why now, right, after eight years? This is one theory. When Zaslow bought the pizza uh, in uh, 2010, Bitcoin was valued at 0 0.0045 USD per coin. That's why he paid 10,000 Bitcoins. When we first got into Bitcoins, uh, it was at uh, $13.84 per coin. Our first sale in 2017, Bitcoin was valued at $3,777 USD per coin. And today, we have here, it's around, I don't know, 8,000, great. The lady in the front says 8,000, I believe her. Uh, it's got, there's a huge fluctuation in December and January. It's an incredibly volatile uh, financial instrument, which we'll talk about. But I think that was one of the reasons why uh, it became so popular, because prices rose dramatically. In 2011, there were around 3,000 wallets, active wallets, participating as uh, holders of Bitcoin. Uh, and the market cap is, was $56 million, market cap being a uh, 
fluid and maybe unreliable number for uh, the total circulation of Bitcoins uh, evaluated in USD. In 2018, there are now over 15 million wallets worldwide, globally. And uh, it's arguable that it's $155 billion market cap. Bitcoin is unusual and successful because it is cutting edge, not because it is cutting edge tech, but because it combined old ideas from previously unrelated fields. I think this is completely interesting in terms of Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself is not a new technology. It is a synthesis of existing technologies that, that had uh, existed in the 80s and the 90s. Some of those things include um, proof of work. You will hear proof of work as a way to describe how Bitcoin works uh, um, if you talk to programmers and developers. Um, proof of work wasn't invented by Bitcoin. It was invented in the 90s by two women who wanted to uh, understand and combat spam. Proof of work was the idea that even then in the mid 90s, early to mid 90s, there was already a prediction that we would be inundated with electronic mail that we don't want. And these two researchers decided to figure out how to combat that. And proof of work was their, them describing a process where each time you sent an email, your computer would have to do just a little bit of computational work, like solve a little mathematical puzzle, which on your computer would just take a second or two. So you won't even notice it, right? It has to do a little work to send that email. And for me and you, regular users, that's fine, because I just want to send you the email. But for spammers, it might take a lot of work because they're, selling, they're sending thousands, if not millions, of spam trying to get you to buy something or invest in something. And the kind of computational power it would take to send those millions of emails at once might not be cost prohibitive. And so proof of work was drawn from an existing uh, technology. Uh, other things like linked timestamping, and uh, fault-tolerant uh, fault distributed computing comes from uh, database science. Cryptography, we've already talked about. And they're not natural, uh, they're not natural, there are no natural relationship between cryptography and, and database work. It's Satoshi who made them. Uh, there's also smart contracts. And Bitcoin was not, in fact, the first uh, uh, cryptocurrency. There were other ones in existence, like uh, Hashcash. Uh, and public keys, identity is part of, anyways, it's a whole litany of existing technologies that Satoshi synthesized to create Bitcoin. As publishers, uh, what is most interesting to me about Bitcoin is its relationship to our understanding history of publishing. And one can make the argument that Satoshi, in inventing Bitcoin, is not unlike someone else who invented a form of publishing, Johannes Gutenberg. As you may or may not know, Johannes Gutenberg is the father of the modern press in the West. In 1450, he premiered his printing press in Germany and uh, went on to change the world. That is um, Satoshi. Just kidding. That's Gutenberg. That is not Gutenberg. I don't know who that is. But he's minting coins. What I wanted to show, why I wanted to show this woodcut was because Gutenberg did the same thing. Gutenberg invented the printing press, not by inventing anything, but by synthesizing existing technologies at the time to create the first printing press. And one of the things that he synthesized with was his experience as a minter, as a goldsmith. Gutenberg was a goldsmith. He learned how to print on paper by printing first on coins in his hometown in Mainz, Germany. So there's a direct relationship between Gutenberg and Satoshi, insofar as they're both making their own money. I like the idea of thinking about Bitcoin and other interesting cryptocurrencies as a form of publishing. So I'm going to push a little further and uh, talk about it as that. Publishing as a model for thinking about it. And in publishing, there are readers and writers. And in the Bitcoin ecosystem, those are the Bitcoin users. The users are the ones who, uh, who uh, create the transactions to each other. And so they're essentially writing to the blockchain because their transactions are being recorded automatically and systematically on the blockchain. The blockchain is the book. It's what's being recorded on and is made public. 
insofar as the most broad definition of publishing is to make something public. And blockchain is open and public, completely transparent. But if this is the case, who are the editors? Who edits the book? Who maintains the book? Who maintains the integrity of the book? They're called miners. Miners is a special kind of participant in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Miner is a, a miner is a computer participating in Bitcoin that compiles the transactions and hashes them. Hashing means securing the information so that it cannot be altered without the entire network uh, knowing. A miner is an important component in the Bit uh, in Bitcoin ecosystem because they're the editors. And miners is, is, uh, may sound, I don't know what it sounds like. It, to me, sounds like a gigantic rig with a bunch of people digging. But really is, is just a piece of software installed on your computer that does a certain thing. And this piece of software, all it does is it maintain, record, record the transactions that it's being broadcast on the peer-to-peer -peer network, maintains them, and create what's called blocks. It's basically a piece of software on a computer. And that's what a miner is. There are many different ways to participate in Bitcoin. Being a miner is one of them, and a very important one, because the miners are the ones who basically record the transactions and make sure they're on the up and up, and they legitimize those transactions. For their reward, by, miners are given two things. For their work of maintaining the blockchain, they get a transaction fee for every uh, transaction that they compile. So if I send Josh a Bitcoin, um, I have to pay a small transaction fee. It's actually a choice. I can. The more I pay as a transaction fee, the more quickly it will be uh, on the block. But let's say I am cheap and I pay very little transaction fee. That transaction fee then gets, uh, then is the profit of the mining computer that records this particular transaction. So they're rewarded, they're incentivized to uh, keep track of the, all the transactions. The second way that they get rewarded is that new Bitcoins for every block they hash and add to the blockchain. This is arguably the most sort of um, the most um, technical. Uh, actually, it's not true. There's many technical things about it, but this is one of the things that trip people up a lot. And so I'm just going to walk through the diagram to see if it makes sense. The TX is the transaction. So let's say I send Josh a Bitcoin, uh, one Bitcoin and I pay a certain transaction fee. I do that by, uh, by sending uh, Bitcoin to, from my wallet to his wallet on our computers or on our mobile phones. And this transaction gets broadcast to the entire Bitcoin network. Everyone hears this transaction. Once our transaction, this transaction, is broadcast, miners compete to pick up that broadcast and to compile it onto their block. And you see miners working to compile and organize all the transactions that's being broadcast in the entire Bitcoin space. Oh, geez. Now the miners then compete to put their block that they've been working on onto the entire blockchain. And, uh, and, and the competition is stiff. It involves proof of work. It involves a bunch of uh, cryptographic protocols. But essentially, miners compete to uh, uh, maintain the order of all the transactions that take place. And the miner who wins the competition through uh, solving this particular puzzle, just like what I talked about in proof of work, gets to put their block onto the blockchain. And once th their block goes on the blockchain, this entire blockchain gets broadcast back to the entire network for everyone to record and to know. So once I send Bitcoin to Josh, it gets recorded, a miner records it, puts that block on the blockchain, that blockchain gets then rebroadcast back to the entire space so that my wallet, which may have the entire blockchain, will now be updated with our transaction. And that happens with every legitimate transaction. And the winner, the, wi the miner who wins this competition of putting on the blockchain, gets new Bitcoins as profit. 
So the system essentially creates Bitcoins, cryptocurrency, for, every, for miners, for their work maintaining the blockchain. Elegance. Um, I, think th I think the elegance of Bitcoin, I think it's elegant. I think conceptually and philosophically, it's elegant. Like a, an equation can be elegant, or like a movement can be elegant. There's something elegant about it. And I think the elegance of Bitcoin as a system is twofold. Satoshi created an incentive inside the system for people to take part in securing and maintaining the entire network. That's number one. Number two is the system of recording transactions, the blockchain, is the currency itself and its primary store of value. It's a little mind-bending. It's a little more hazian, I think, that the ledger that keeps track of all our transactions become valuable precisely because it is still a ledger that everyone looks to to legitimize their transactions. There's a circularity to it, and uh, there's an elegance to it. I'm going to quickly go through some of the practical stuff because I want to bring Maya and Grayson on. Um, a, a practical question, how do you get Bitcoin? How do you get, how do you get BTC? Uh, there are a couple ways. There are online exchanges uh, that you can sign up to purchase Bitcoin using uh, regular fiat money. Uh, there are those in the U.S., there are those globally. Uh, back in 2011, we didn't have those. We had to send a certified check to a P.O. box in Virginia, and we had to write our public address on a piece of paper. They wouldn't accept it even printed from an inkjet or a laser writer. We had to handwrite it. Today, it's much easier, and in fact, it's one of the easiest ways if you were to participate as someone who wants to purchase it. There are also Bitcoin ATMs. I think there's one in Wall Street, there's one in Harlem, there's a couple of them in Brooklyn. Has anyone used those? Did you get it? Great. So they work. Uh, OTC trades over the counter, that basically means you're trading Bitcoins amongst yourselves, not through an exchange or a third party, just friends on Craigslist, I don't know. I don't know what people use. Uh, mining. You can, you, can, you can earn Bitcoin by mining. You can, uh, you can set up a computer that mines Bitcoins. This uh, is, it, I would not encourage you to do it in New York because mining involves a lot of electricity. The uh, miner, mining computers use a lot of computational power, which equals to a lot of electricity. So there are real specialized computers now that does nothing but mining. And uh, there are people who uh, are in uh, places where electricity is cheap that does mining. New York has uh, one of the highest electricity rates in the country, if not the world. It's like 19 cents per kilowatt hours. It's just not um, cost prohibitive. Plus, apparently, they busted a guy in Brooklyn for mining because his miner was so powerful that it was um, interfering with cell phone reception. Did you read that? They, the FCC busted it. It wasn't even the SEC. It was the FCC because people in his neighborhood couldn't get cell, couldn't get phone calls. I don't know what neighborhood it was. Um, last but not least, you can steal and hack them. Again, I don't encourage that at all. Uh, there are some things about a wallet. If you were to get uh, Bitcoin, what do you do with it? Well, you're going to need a wallet to hold on to them. There are many kinds of wallets. Uh, and uh, I just want to take through uh, just three basic classes of wallets. You've got what's called um, hot wallets, which is the most liquid, which means liquid basically means that you can uh, easily uh, convert uh, uh, your currency into another form of currency. So Bitcoin into USD or Euro. It's the most liquid. Uh, hot wallets are where you hold your Bitcoins on a web service or a web exchange that's online. Um, there are plenty of them around, 80% um, of them are scams, you have to be very careful. Uh, but there are legitimate uh, hot wallets that are online that can use. Um, they're very easy to use, the problem is that they're probably the least secure, because as we know, no website is safe, and there have certainly been hacks with wallets online. There's medium storage uh, for wallets, which is basically a download of a desktop app on your local computer. So you're not storing your crypto on an online exchange or an online service, but you're storing it on your desktop, 
on your local computer. It is more secure than the hot wallets, but still not as secure as cold wallets because you're still online because all our computers are essentially online 24-7 at this point. The last uh, form of uh, wallets is the cold storage, which is essentially a, a form of storage where you put it on something that is not online at all. Uh, a USB drive, a piece of paper, even your memory. You can just memorize your Bitcoin address and your wallet, and it's technically safe. Crypto risks. Lots of them. Volatile financial asset, incredibly volatile. Uh, the price in December was 19,700. It's dropped down to around 8,000 now. It was 2,000 in July, June, July. It's incredibly volatile. Uh, attacks from banking sector. Uh, JP Morgan Chase, the head of JP Morgan Chase, called it a fraud. Um, uh, central banking has uh, been up in arms about the development of crypto. While at the same time, they are uh, developing, uh, oops, competing fintech. So at the same time that JP Morgan Chase was demonizing Bitcoin, they were developing their own capacity for blockchain technology. So in a way, they're shorting and longing it at the same time. Uh, government prosecution. Uh, people are being arrested uh, for using it, Russia, China. In New York, um, there is something called the uh, Bit License which is, uh, in, is, um, which is a legal framework that basically dissuades people from uh, uh, doing, using crypto uh, in business, um, unless you have uh, seven gazillion dollars. There's scams and frauds for a technology that, it, that has a market cap of $155 billion. You're gonna have to expect that people wanna steal it. And so the scams and frauds are rampant. It's legion. It's quite scary, actually. And I think one of the things that we like to talk about at the crypto group is that you may not be a programmer. You may not even be in tech. But the crypto is simply part of our uh, future economic uh, life. And to know about it is to s maybe the best thing about knowing about it is perhaps just to be a little more vigilant about what it is and what it is not. Uh, uncertainty from development, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is a form of software and they do develop and they do break. And so it is, uh, it is uh, scary because technology is married with money. And last but not least, uh, user security risks. Um, because crypto is decentralized and peer to peer, you're essentially putting uh, uh, money into your own hands. It's kind of like putting money in your, wa in your mattress because there's no third party. You're the person taking care of it. And so uh, there can be times when you don't know where your money is because you forgot which mattress you put it under. Which is, oh, sorry, that sounds weird. <laughs> you know what I mean. I think the main takeaways f for me is uh, Bitcoin and other cryptos are not solutions. They are new forms of leverage. Uh, if anyone talks about crypto and Bitcoin as a solution to anything, I th you can most likely bet that it's a scam. That's how we take it. Um, that's how we talk about it. If anyone talks to you about crypto and Bitcoin as a solution to your economic future, your lifestyle, your student loans, it's probably a scam. But what it does provide us, uh, especially for those of us who are artists and writers, is it can provide a new form of leverage in our lives, a new form of uh, uh, economic and uh, perhaps even aesthetic leverage. Um, crypto, for me, is also a new field for experimenting in aesthetic, economic, and political organizing. We've been actively thinking about the blockchain as a form of publishing. We're not starting a token, but we do think of it as a form of publishing, as we've said, as I've said. So I think we're going to try to, uh, we try to pursue it. And also, uh, and also connect with people who are doing interesting crypto projects out there. Because uh, I think the field is wide open, and it's still very new. It's so new. Uh, and that's why we're interested in it. Um, with that said, I think this is a perfect transition for Maya and Grayson, who I think are doing some of the most interesting crypto projects out there there is. Uh, and they're gonna talk about Bail Block. So uh, let's give them a hand.
Hey. Um, I think first it would be good to just name the other people involved in the project. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, Francis Sang, uh, JB Rubinovitz, Sam Levine, uh, Rachel Rosenfeld, Devin Kenny, and other members of the Dark Inquiry Collective. Which is a collective that is run out of the New Inquiry, which is a magazine and publishing platform. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the influences of Bail Block. Um, starting with uh, SETI at Home. Has anyone heard of this before? Um, it's a totally amazing project. Uh, it happened in 1999 when SETI, which is short for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, kind of had a funding problem. And so um, in order to sort of correct their diminishing budget, the uh, Berkeley group of uh, SETI enthusiasts um, decided to create this application called SETI at Home, uh, which was an application that you could download and become a volunteer uh, in order to kind of effectively create a supercomputer. So you would download this application, and you would be getting raw data from the satellite feed, uh, and then you would kind of crunch all that data and uh, you know push it back to um, the SETI research lab uh, at UC Berkeley in a more usable, parsable format for their research. And uh, it actually worked, and it saved them you know all kinds of money on uh, supercomputer. Um, and it also you know brought people into like a new level of uh, participation. They became more you know involved in what SETI was doing. Um, and then also, like many people, I have you know a Bitcoin mining story, uh, which goes back to 2010 when I was in grad school. I won't say where, um, but I was managing a computer lab and um, had heard about Bitcoin and uh, you know Bitcoin mining and thought it was really interesting for all the reasons that Paul outlined. Um, uh, you know, uh, less, I was less interested at the time in kind of unbanking and more in just the technical aspects of how you would accomplish this system. Uh, and mining played, you know, a big part in that. And so I installed sort of surreptitiously uh, Bitcoin mining software in the lab uh, that would mine Bitcoin while the computers weren't in use. And I only did this for a short period of time, probably a couple of days, um, and generated a couple of Bitcoin, like two Bitcoin at the time, which I think was worth maybe like 10 bucks, um, not even a whole pizza. Uh, and uh, you know, today that would be worth like nearly $20,000, but I didn't really hang on to it. Um, but in any case, it stuck in the back of my mind as a really interesting uh, thing, just generating value out of thin air or out of compute power and electricity. Um, so then it's, you know, fast forward to the election of Donald Trump and uh, it becomes really apparent that uh, the ways that we are expending political labor online on Facebook, liking posts and posting arguments and all this kind of thing was uh, not only kind of politically ineffective, but it was also just contributing to the coffers of corporations like Facebook. Um, so I think for me the question became how do you weaponize clicktivism, this thing that people are already going to do, this kind of like latent background noise, um, to produce material resources for radical political causes. Um, uh, this, is, this is what you would see if you had downloaded SETI at home. Um, so uh, of course I get you know, uh, introduced to Maya and the people at the New Inquiry, and uh, this becomes a much more uh, interesting political project when, uh, which Maya will talk about um, after this. But uh, what we did was um, create Bail Block, and I'll give a kind of a technical rundown of what this is for people who are unfamiliar. Um, this is what you would see if you visit the Bail Block website. So you can download this application, and much like SETI at home, uh, once installed, each user acts as a node on a distributed network of cryptocurrency miners. Uh, any computer with the app installed and enabled is actively mining cryptocurrency. In this case, we're using Monero as opposed to Bitcoin, um, precisely because there's these ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits, these machines that have the sole purpose of mining Bitcoin, and so participation is uh, sort of not possible. Um, uh, in terms of mining. And so there's a few cryptocurrencies that are developed specifically to avoid this problem, and Monero is one of them. Um, so uh, running Bail Block on your uh, computer takes about as much uh, resources as a YouTube video or something like that. So you just kind of set it and forget it. Um, and as with any cryptocurrency mining, the process is incentivized, right? So 
while you're verifying transactions on the network by having bail block installed, which you know is totally hands free. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's uh, it's giving you a kickback of small amounts of the cryptocurrency in question. In this case, Monero. Um, so essentially, the more people that use bail block, the more Monero we're able to generate, and then we take that Monero at the end of you know every period of time um, and cash it out to US dollars and give it to our partners, the Bronx Freedom Fund. And they use that money to get people out on bail. Um, so after the first five weeks, we generated exactly $3,333.77 and cut a check to the Bronx Freedom Fund on uh, Christmas Day. And this is just what it would look like on your computer if you were running it. Um. I'm not a technologist or even really a crypto investor, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the political stakes of the project. Um, and bail, for those of you who don't already know, is an amount of money that's typically set at arraignments that the courts require of the recently arrested. So these are people that haven't been convicted of anything yet, um, but they're required to pay bail uh, in exchange for their immediate term release. And so for those who can afford it, posting bail is a means of getting out of jail, allowing people to avoid pretrial incarceration, which is the period of time that lasts from arrest to case disposition. And that period can last weeks, months, or sometimes even years, and can result in the loss of jobs, housing, um, child custody, immigration status. Um, so it can obviously be very, very devastating. Um, and prosecutors and judges know how detrimental pretrial incarceration can be. And so they work in concert to coerce low-income people to accept plea deals in exchange for their release. So in New York, 90% of people who can't pay bail end up taking these plea deals. That means they forfeit their right to a constant They've, that means they forfeit their constitutional right to be tried before a jury, they're never allowed to argue their case, and they never can be found innocent. They also will then have records moving forward, uh, which prosecutors can use um, if someone is arrested again. Um, and so, put simply, these people are found guilty of poverty, and they also compose the majority of the incarcerated population in the US. 70% of people in American prisons and jails have not yet been convicted of any crime. Um, and so from a critical standpoint, I certainly didn't understand currency mining when Grayson brought, cryptocurrency mining when Grayson brought the project to TNI, but there were other forms of currency mining um, that I was more familiar with because of the communities that I moved through, things like bail, um, also predatory debt financing. And so bail and cryptocurrency are sort of a generative, if counterintuitive pair in the sense that Bail is a tool of coercion, as I've said, it's a tool of surveillance, predictive policing, but it's also a form of currency mining from low-income individuals and communities of color. Um, and so in that sense, bail intensifies the economic stratification born of capitalism, and like capitalism requires a scarcity of cash, prosecutors and judges are only able to co coerce people into taking plea deals if they can't actually afford bail. Um, and so sort of within that schema, um, cash and freedom are seen as equitable, and cash um, for freedom is a literal legal exchange, which is obviously fucked up um, and has roots in slavery, and in my mind renders totally clear that the project of abolition hasn't yet been realized. And so part of what we were doing and or trying to do in Launch Bail Block was to sort of render that equation clear, but also to um, push a bunch of money generated from nowhere into that equation. And what I mean when I say money generated from nowhere, obviously cryptocurrency is generated from somewhere. It's generated from electricity. Um, I mostly mean that it's generated from nowhere in the sense that cryptocurrency and this distributed mining um, that comes with bail block generates money that, um, that uh, doesn't deplete the resources of black and brown communities. Um, and so bail block sort of allows you to offer your laptop or your desktop, now your phone, your tablet, um, as the target for state mining in the stead of, of these communities. Um, and part of what I like about the project, and I, I've been told that I'm not supposed to say this as like a talking point, but um, I think 
uh, bail bulk is tight because you can sort of force institutions to, that might otherwise not be willing to pay money to get people out of jail, um, to donate their electricity toward that end. So say you work at, um, or if you're a student at a university that maybe like invests in private prisons or whatever, you can plug your laptop into a power strip, run bail block, and sort of force them to uh, donate money to get people out of jail. Um, you can use it at a gentrifying coffee shop. Um, if your landlord pays for your electricity, you can use it in your house. Um, that said, uh, y none of these institutions, or like if you run bail block at home, your electricity bill isn't gonna go up that much. Um, it'll go up like maybe a dollar, but um, I really like the, the symbolism of that. Yeah, we were trying to get them to run it on the presentation computer, but no dice so far. <laughs> Could be generating bail <laughs> funds while we talk. Um, <laughs> I think uh, another thing that I like about the project and have learned going through the project is uh, that there's kind of a very small subset of projects and people that are interested in like really being kind of critical of the applications of this technology. And I'm really glad that we're doing this with Badlands for that reason. Um, you know, I think it's kind of, in some ways, a really spur uh, spurious claim to say that uh, cryptocurrency is a revolutionary financial system. Um, because, you know, for example, I attended the Ethereal Summit uh, last summer, and it was like 95% white men, people that looked like me. And so you have to ask, like, how revolutionary is a new financial system if it's going to benefit the exact same cast of characters? Um, and it makes me wonder, you know, what would a revolutionary financial system actually look like? Um, and I think uh, it would be a system that, you know, necessarily considers reparations as a basic assumption, automatically detects and corrects for gendered wage discrepancies, redirects, you know, inheritance towards public education and healthcare, that kind of a thing. Um, and this is made possible uh, in some ways by the cryptocurrencies that have come um, after uh, Bitcoin, like Ethereum, uh, that run on a smart contract system. So if you know Bitcoin is a, a ledger, the blockchain is being a long series of transactions that have happened. Uh, something like Ethereum is uh, the ledger can possess, can hold uh, conditional logic, right? So you can write programs that exist immutably in this system. Um, and there's some really interesting projects that take advantage of that kind of technology. Um, there's Terra Zero, which is a project that gives a smart contract system to a forest so that it can sell itself off to loggers at a sustainable rate and eventually buy itself in perpetuity um, to just be an autonomous forest forever. Um, there's Doma City, which is a project that issues tokens to renters. Um, and so, you know, by paying rent, you're given tokens in exchange. And so through renting, you can come to own uh, a kind of a, a network, have fluid ownership of a network of properties. Um, this removes banks and mortgages from the picture, and a model emerges in which uh, the workers of a city can come to actually inherit the real estate and housing. Um, so I think, you know, <laughs> Uh, I think this is really interesting to me, is the ability to kind of inscribe ethics into an immutable system. Uh, it seems like a really powerful tool for workers. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, has anyone seen the Elon Musk just sort of constantly worrying about AI taking control of everything? Like if you just look, I should have had a slide of it. But, you know, just Google it and you'll see just every day, he's like, we can't let the robots rule us. And I think that... Uh, it's actually because he's worried about being subjugated in the way that he and the rest of the capitalist class subjugate their workers. Um, and this sort of smart contracts and you know, intervention on the blockchain seems to me like a really good tool for workers moving forward. Um, some people kind of balk at the idea of uh, being ruled by an algorithm or something, but it's, to me it's pretty clear that we already are ruled by algorithmic principles of capitalism, which make very specific, um, you know, uh, decisions about administering and, uh, and compensating labor and, you know, who's, what kind of work is legal and illegal and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's important that, you know, the left get involved in cryptocurrencies at this very critical early stage of its development. Um, and workers should organize to write the code of the ledger of the future.
Yeah, I think part of the intervention we're trying to make with Bail Block 2 um, is, is sort of like in the fact that um, tech companies have long insisted that their products provide liberation. Um, and mostly they mean this as a figure of speech. Um, I'm trying to think of examples like, uh, I don't know, GCAL provides like a freedom to not have to remember events in your head or something like that. Um, and obviously there are much more egregious examples I'm being sort of facetious, but um, if these products provide liberation from anything, it's usually liberation from a kind of liberal malaise. Um, but for black people, brown people, low income people, um, the struggle for liberation is very much literal. Um, and so there exists an obvious problem when um, the tech world promises metaphorical freedom when the state it works in concert with ensures that literal freedom from things like surveillance, from imprisonment, from policing is denied. And so the work of any technologist in my mind, and I'm, I'm not a technologist, so. You are now. Yeah, <laughs> now I am. Uh, the work of any technologist in my mind should be to retool the means of innovation to meet the needs of individuals and communities who are in the unfortunate position of insisting that their right to life is real and therefore urgent. And so part of what we are trying to do with Bail Block 2 is render clear the ways in which um, technology could address a literal need for, for liberation. Um, and just to sort of contextualize the project, um, uh, Bell Block is one of a series of rhetorical software projects um, that we've been rolling out from the New Inquiry and in tandem with the Dark Inquiry Collective, which Grayson mentioned at the beginning. It's a collective of artists, technologists, writers. Um, and the first project in the series was the White Collar Crime Predictive Policing app, um, which we launched last spring that was created by Francis Tseng, who's also on the Bailbock team, Sam Levine, who's also on the Bailbock team, and Brian Clifton. Um, and what that app does is it uses predictive policing technology to predict white collar crime in your area. So there's like a, a heat map and you can like go down to basically like the block level and see the likelihood that white collar crime is going to occur in your area. Um, and it's definitely more of a gimmick than Bail Block is. Bail Block serves a material function, but both projects use real data. Um, and our goal in launching them and circulating them isn't really to build infrastructure or to organize. Those are very much the purviews of activists, um, and we are not activists. Um, but we're trying to sway public opinion. So in the case of Bail Block, um, we sort of expected that um, people would criticize the project on the basis that, I don't know, like maybe these people don't deserve to get bailed out of jail. Um, and what we found was that no one really critiqued the project on that basis. People, our biggest critics were basically like, there are more efficient ways to donate to bail funds, which is sort of the raddest critique because it just led to more people donating directly to bail funds, which is exactly the reality we want. And the founder of TNI and the former publisher of TNI and someone who also worked on Bail Block, Rachel Rosenfeld, um, in an interview that she did recently, um, sort of uh, encapsulated this ethos by saying, we're not advancing a political agenda, we're putting forth a common sense, um, which I think is sort of like the perfect one-liner to describe what we're trying to do. And so in this case, the common sense was that bail is fucked up, no one should be in pretrial incarceration, and we really found that in, in the press um, that helped circulate the project, um, that was sort of taken as a basic assumption. I think we hope that in the next iteration of the project, we're going to be relaunching in July and starting to pay um, immigration bonds. Um, we can take that one step further so that the common sense is no one should be in incarceration, period. We'll see. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Download Bail Block. We can move the...
Yeah. Sure. You can sit next to me. <laughs> so, um, maybe the thing uh, to do first is uh, for people to introduce themselves um, that have not spoken tonight, if that's cool. Meredith? Hi, my name is Meredith. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Print All Over Me. And we, uh, we've taken crypto on and off for many years and um, I've been personally a big, uh, I love experimenting with all the new uh, crypto technology, Ethereum, smart contracts. I'm just like a big geek, so I love, I love our jam sessions with the Badlands crew. Can I just point out what you're wearing? <laughs> I, I made this for the event. Can you describe what it is for people in the back? So, or people um, who don't want to stare? There are, you know, so the first <laughs> ICO was, does everyone here know what an ICO is? Okay, so, <laughs> so there's this idea that, um, so you have Bitcoin, right? And Bitcoin, um, I guess is like the, the first popular cryptocurrency in this new era, proof of work or proof of something uh, in a decentralized system and a bunch of other things that Paul talked about. So then how do you have new currencies? So, uh, so um, I guess one of the more, more famous ones was uh, Ethereum. When Ethereum started, people said, okay, we're, gonna, we're going to sell Ether uh, for a certain amount of Bitcoin. And they called it, I, did they call it e Ethereum a, an ICO? Was it actually called it an, an initial yeah. coin it offering? It was the first one, yeah. It was the first initial coin offering. So it's like you could buy, it's like we're gonna sell, I forget how much Ether they were selling, but like we're gonna, we're gonna sell like 100,000 Ether and everyone buys some Ether, kind of like a stock offering. And ever since then, and then when Ethereum started, part of the technology in Ethereum was that you could build tokens it, on top of uh, Ethereum. It was actually like one of like, they have all these different things you can build with, e with Ether on like you go to their website and you, it's like you can build a Kickstarter or you can build a token like Ether or something else, some other stuff, I don't know. Um, so then people started building all these other tokens. So you could pay, you could buy a token with Ether in, in, and you could buy like, <laughs> you, I mean, you know, all these shit coins or legitimate can coins. Can you just point out one? Okay, well, you know, hey, so. Connect. What part of your body do you okay, want to point to? Okay, you know, to? I, I gotta say, I like I Steam. Like no one likes Steam. <laughs> I'm the only one that likes Steam. I don't like Steam. No one likes it. No one likes it. I don't even know how to spell Steam. I know. It's somewhere here. It's, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's not, it, it, it's, uh, where is it? It's got squiggly lines. Steam. And then Litecoin. The Litecoin was like the third coin that Coinbase offered. You know, it's like the cheap coin. You know, the guy that started Litecoin sold all of his Litecoin. Charlie. <laughs> it's the silver, too. And then Bitcoin's Miriam has a lot <laughs> to say about Litecoin. <laughs> um, you know, we got, we, he, anyone can come over and, and take a look at, I think, there, I think I have 25 different coins, but there are, there are thousands. And um, you can go to various websites and track all the different tokens and their prices. And um, you, know, you could day trade tokens and <laughs> lose a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. Anyway. <laughs> Um, my name is Miriam Katzeff, and I'm co-founder of Primary Information, and um, I first learned about Bitcoin in 2014 when I tried to mine it, but um, I don't love altcoins, um, and I'm not an investor. <laughs> in altcoins, but I am interested in what is being built off of Ethereum, and I am also very interested in the concept of unbanking. You, 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 t um, you told me a good, interesting story about your experience at HSBC. Yeah, um, in, <laughs> in 2012, or so when um, HSBC was in trouble for laundering Mexican drug money, rather than correct the problem, they decided to close a number of um, trade union, nonprofit organizations, small businesses, bank accounts with very little notice um, because 
they were the types of businesses that were at risk for money laundering, but also with the small businesses, which they closed like thousands and thousands of them. It just wasn't profitable for them to um, maintain those accounts anymore. They decided they weren't interested in that kind of business and they would give people like 30 days to close their bank accounts and also associated credit accounts. And that kind of thing actually will damage someone's credit, you know, if your um, credit card is like closed as um, an act that you didn't choose to do in a certain way. Um, and so the idea that you would have a very little money and just one day be told you have to find somewhere else for this money and scramble to find another bank that would like your undesirable money uh, really kind of inspires a certain sector of people to just take control of their own wallets, not necessarily um, in uh, prior to like the fall, I would say, when cryptocurrency was somewhat less volatile than it is now, people were um, interested in just managing their own money and uh, using their Cryptocurrency not as assets, but as like real currency for day-to-day -day exchanges. And the idea that you would do this without being tracked and without being taxed or at risk um, was appealing to me. Hey, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul. <laughs> um, Paul Pham. Uh, you can confuse me with Paul Chan. I can only imagine good things happening from that um, misidentification. I'm a member of the Invisible College, which is a distributed research group um, that my friends and I funded, sorry, founded in Seattle. And I'm also building a community home called an Arcology um, here in New York City. Does anyone know what an Arcology is, or has anyone heard of an Arcology or played SimCity? It's a uh, it's an integrated live-work environment. It's a hyper building of the no future. No one played SimCity. I'm, I'm oh, really sad about this. Thank yeah. you, Okay, Maya. thank you. Thank you. Uh, it takes uh, 10,000 recycled TVs and a million simoleons, I think, to build a, an arcology in SimCity. Um, but we'll do it for, for much cheaper here in New York. Uh, I first heard about Bitcoin from my friend Mike, uh, who was like the first crypto millionaire that I ever met. And uh, he was like very excited about it. but. This was in 2014, and I knew about it much earlier because it was released in 2009, but a lot of academics, because um, I, I studied computer science in school, I went to grad school, uh, you know, I even became like a college professor for a short time, and uh, we all knew about it, but we didn't take it seriously, and you know, it's like a thing to joke about. And then um, the value increased, and that causes some people, more people to make jokes about it, but then you know, other people take it seriously. Um, some uh, banks or some like large institutions start taking it like very seriously. And I am an investor. Um, I, I've traded, I've mined. Um, for a while when I was homeless, I was like paying rent and food with ether, which, you know, again, I have stories where the ether I used to pay for ramen or a futon is- Is that uh, true? That is true, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that was an interesting time in my life, but I can be a counter to other, other people here. I'm a, I am a technologist. Um, and yeah, I do uh, think about cryptocurrencies as money. I do think of them as solving some problems or potential solutions. And so I'm happy to disagree with some of the things that have been said here tonight, but you know, in a, in a good natured way, because I think we all want to work on really interesting things. And I am, my goal in life right now, um, I quit my job at Etsy recently. Um, and now I concentrate full time on thinking of working on interesting crypto projects. I would love to see crypto useful in meeting basic human needs, like um, paying for food, paying for rent, um, affordable housing, uh, you know, like the DOMA project. Uh, also just for art projects, like I think it's really weird that you can have a robotic corporation tell people what to do, like an algorithm that runs people's lives. Like you could work for a robo corporation and uh, you know, if it doesn't pay its taxes, like how can the US government like collect money from it if it's, uh, it lives on the internet? and it's a weird digital organism. Those are the kinds of things that I like thinking about. Yeah, so that's me. Cool, I, I think there's um, an embarrassment of riches on stage in terms of brain power, and so maybe we should open it up for questions for people. On, can we turn up the house lights maybe? Is that, is that okay? 
I think it'd be nice to just have a conversation if people are interested in asking us or any one of us questions about what uh, we've talked about uh, tonight, because I think we can talk amongst ourselves <laughs> for a very long time, as we've done in the past. Oh, there's one. Hi. Um, about mining, you said there's uh, the blockchain is the ledger, and the miners have their own ledgers. So, how do those ledgers get together, and and you can, and keep track if everyone, sort of has their own? Or did I not understand that? Well, I mean, they're all so. I at the end of the day, it's it's a path towards everyone sharing the same ledger. So it's the miners are gathering all of the transactions that are not yet part of the ledger, the list of transactions that have been, you know, confirmed, and adding them, uh, you know, solving them, make sure that they make sense. That person A has the five Bitcoin to send to person B, and then, you know, placing that at the end of the blockchain as the most recent block. Um, and then this also has to be verified uh, by everyone that that you know makes sense. It, oh, it's happening like every second. <laughs> I think or actually new blocks are, are hashed every like two minutes or something. What no, is it's it? ten, ten minutes for Bitcoin. Ten yeah. minutes for Bitcoin or something like Ethereum is like fifteen well, seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's part of that's part of the real debate about Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies. It's a question of scalability and efficiency. I think a, a real uh, criticism of Bitcoin is that it is inefficient. It takes X minutes to update the, all the ledgers on the ecosystem. And because, of, because it's decentralized, it takes time to distribute that file to everyone on that system. And so a main criticism of Bitcoin is that it's inefficient. But its inefficiency is one of its virtues, if you can think of it as a form of security. I think because there's so many stop gaps and um, checks and balances, there is a reason why the blocks are a certain size. There's a reason why it takes a certain amount of time. I think that's one, I think, uh, that's one way to think about it, I think. Hey, can you talk about the environmental impact of cryptocurrency? I'm happy to start this one because um, and that was like one of the main criticisms that we received for our project. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of things to say here. One is that I think in general, I mean, all, all forms of labor require energy, right? Anytime we're engaged and we're like online, we're watching YouTube videos, uh, we're like posting political discussions, we're like burning fossil fuels. Um, and uh, and so that's something to keep in mind, I think. And I mean, I was, with something like Bitcoin, the environmental impact is quite high. Um, but there are all, also efforts in the cryptocurrency sphere to uh, mitigate some of these effects. Like uh, mining is all part of this proof of work algorithm. And there's some kind of emerging methods that have been proposed, like proof of stake, where if you just have you know enough of a cryptocurrency to stake, then you can kind of step forward and be like you know be randomly selected and say okay I will solve you know this group of transactions and put it on the blockchain. Um, and I think like you know uh, a lot of the environmental stuff is is legit, but it's also the U.S. Treasury I'm sure burns through a lot of electricity, um, and you know I think uh, the environmental impact of something like Bitcoin is still dwarfed by something like meat consumption uh, in the United States. Or just think of like your local bank branch keeping their electricity on 24 hours a day, their empty ATM kiosks. Like there are all these ways in which power is being used inefficiently. And a lot of the miners um, now reside in countries where uh, electricity is being subsidized, like in China, or um, actually, I don't know where. Yeah, I mean, I think 80% of Bitcoin hash power is centralized in China, where they overbuilt infrastructure. So there's a lot of cheap hydropower from, you know, the communist regime is like good at a lot of things, like quickly getting a lot of infrastructure built. 
Um, but then as a result, like five Chinese billionaires control um, the majority of Bitcoin hash rate. Um, but in other countries, especially in the US, uh, I think about this a lot because I have friends who run Bitcoin mines and they deliberately chose places close to hydropower. Uh, for example, in eastern Washington, close to, uh, I forget which river it is, uh, it's in the Tri-Cities area, the electricity is three cents per kilowatt hour. I know these numbers like really um, specifically just like Paul does because like when I moved to New York, I immediately asked people like how much do you pay for electricity and landlords wouldn't know and it would actually like matter to me a lot because I was wondering like can you mine Bitcoin here? <laughs> and uh, I mean, it is an environmental concern. Um, Ethereum is kind of a hippie coin because the founder of Vitalik Buterin, he thought like, well, how can we move to a more sustainable um, algorithm, a consensus algorithm? And as Grayson mentioned, proof of stake is um, what Ethereum is moving to and has planned to move to for like over a year now. That's something that will happen this year. That's like a pretty big event. And then um, that will like save um, energy and hopefully like make crypto more sustainable. But but yeah, it is a concern. You can do cool things with the waste heat also. You can, um, you can grow plants indoors. Uh, I was recently in California where like, they recently legalized marijuana, so that's like an interesting um, connection. Wait, what are you saying? Say that again. <laughs> oh, you can use the waste heat from mining to act oh, perform right. useful functions. You could use it to be a space heater. Like, yes, people burn a company started that. They made a miner that is used as a heater yeah, in your, Sweden. Your space heater at home is burning electricity all the time and it could be earning you money instead. That's, yeah. I also had a business idea earlier today, but I want to like blab it because I still want to like make it. Um, so I'm um, really interested in the um, information in crypto part of the blockchain. So in China, there's a story which, rip story, like, um, and then you know how one thing the Chinese government is really good at is like the filter information, they blocked it from the general public. And then one of the students actually uploads the whole story encryptalized into the blockchain so you will be there forever, theoretically. And what I don't understand is how that really work, how could a blockchain which just including the information of trading can also include a like literal story. So each block can contain a small amount of meta information, at least in Bitcoin. It would take a long time to encode sort of like a full story, um, but there are other coins where you could encode a much, you know, slightly longer, but they're all gonna be pretty small. Um, there are storage related coins like SIA or StoreJ or the upcoming Filecoin. Uh, and there's also IPFS, which is uh, an immutable web hash. There's a way of publishing it to the internet that will be available forever, and what you can do is store a short address on, uh, in Bitcoin, for example, and then that points to a much longer story somewhere else. That's how I would imagine they've done it, but that's a really interesting um, new story. I didn't hear about that. Um, oh, I have a question. So you guys talked a lot about the decentralization. That's sort of one of the, the selling points of cryptocurrency. But it always seems to me like crypto is extremely centralized, most obvious uh, in the developers who kind of control and oversee the ecosystem, um, the exchanges where you have to trade. And um, you know, it's, it's led to a handful of people becoming extremely wealthy and holding most of these coins. And so, I don't know, I, whenever I, I think about crypto, it seems decentralized a lot of times in the same way that like a pyramid scheme is decentralized. Anybody can join, but it's just all going to the top. Um, and how do you guys make sense of that? Is it, is it a flaw in the system? Is it just a way, a path that it's going through towards some actually decentralized thing? Or is it actually decentralized and I just don't know what I'm talking about? Well, you, I think it's basically, um, I think you're right. The impl so the implementation of Bitcoin as it is now is, um, is centralized, like the, in terms of like who owns the wallets, who owns the Bitcoin wallets. But I think that you could build another c currency with, on top of the same principles. And there is an interesting project, Circles, has anyone looked at that? 
you can Google it. But basically, everyone, cre everyone has their own currency. So if I want to transact with Miriam, I will give Miriam Meredith currency, and she will give me Miriam currency. And it sounds like incredibly flaky. But, you, but um, there is this idea that, um, that maybe that we can have more local currencies that actually do things for your, that actually benefit local communities that you can build on top of the cryptocurrency currency infrastructure, like sort of like the decentralization and, the, and proof of work or proof of stake, all the different elements. So maybe Bitcoin is not the solution or Ethereum or and maybe it's something else, but the, the infrastructure is still is there to enable that. Yeah, I remember the first time I met Paul, I was interviewing him for a, a story and um, something that we were talking about, I don't know if you remember this, is uh, about um, how cryptocurrency could function if it ceases to be viable as a means for like the accrual of personal wealth. And because I'm not a technologist, I think only in terms of speculation, um, but it's exciting to me to like try to imagine um, projects like, like Bail Block, which could, it's a technology that could never get any one person wealthy. Um, but what would a cryptocurrency ecosystem look like if Bitcoin was back at 45 cents? Um, I don't know. That's exciting to me. Probably not exciting to other people in this room, but. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can rethink money from scratch. Like, what if you built in like demorage? So if you don't spend your cryptocurrency, it grows away. Like, how do you how do you combat hoarding? How do you combat? I mean, this is you can rethink what money does now. You know, I, I think it's exciting. I um, I think the spirit of your I think your spirit of what you see in terms of centralization, um, I think is something that people do feel. But my personal opinion is it's still early. It's very early. Even though it started in 2009 and it's now 2018, it's very early. And the fact that we're here as artists and writers and publishers uh, um, talking about it is maybe perhaps our way of trying to diversify the ecosystem so that others will be involved in it too. So that it doesn't simply end up being in the hands of the same kinds of developers and technologists and the fintech people. I think when, if, you know, I, I can't help but think that when Badlands got into in 2011 and, at, uh, uh, and that there were more than cypherpunks be interested in Bitcoin then, it would simply be a little more diverse today in terms, in all terms. But be that as it may, um, it is still, te technically speaking, a system where you can jump on and jump off and it's a technically speaking where you can contribute to the core dev, and it's technically speaking where even Bitcoin has its own development of programming layer with the implementation of Rookstock, Lightning Network, Multisig, that has the capacity to um, use Bitcoin um, as a cryptocurrency and as a form of leverage for ind more independent-minded people. I think you're right in terms of certain powers being centralized from miners to people who are institutional banking who's getting into it to basically the whales who own like 4,000 bitcoins because they were mining it in a, in a trailer park in Tana Tallahassee in 2012. Uh, you can't do anything about that. But what you can do is perhaps learn a little bit about the entire tech development and technology and to be open-minded enough to get in it either you know, in, in participate in some way, because it's still open. In a couple of weeks, there's um, consensus is coming. Blockchain week, sponsored by the city of New York, is happening in a couple of weeks. Um, programming seminars is coming. People are trying to sell you stuff. I encourage people to uh, take a look and just, uh, just see uh, what shit there is out there. Um, and to learn a little bit for yourself, because it's, uh, to me, it's not going away. The cryptocurrency is not going away, for better and for worse. So we might as well get a handle on it now. I like. I want to also want to say I like this question because when I was teaching classes, uh, I taught at a very radical liberal arts college, and my students would ask me like, "Well, this is great," and they would call it Buttcoin to like make fun of it. But like, how is this different? My daughter my, calls my it that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
uh, and they would ask like, how is this different like than some other money that will help the rich get richer? And I didn't have a good answer for them. And I keep thinking about, um, yeah, like what is a good answer? How is it going to be better or create like the social good that we want that's different than cash? And there are various ways because of Ethereum or smart contract systems, you could make, you could incentivize different social behaviors. You can make a coin that is only spendable, for example, within uh, New York City or within some city limits so that encourages local spending. Um, like Meredith said, you could make a coin that like decreases in value over time, so you have to spend it instead of hoard it. And these are things you couldn't do before, so that's also interesting, but you have to design your system carefully because um, it could have like unintended consequences. You can think of it as a social experiment where you just keep releasing new coins, you see how people use it, you know, maybe it's a disaster, you like release a new version and then you keep refining it. And yeah, it's still very early. Um, I'm interested to see how it turns out. The city, do you hear this? The city of Berkeley is launching their own coin for capital improvements. And homelessness. Is that true? Yeah, to uh, address the housing crisis, it's going to launch in May. Um, and other cities are already looking to it. Yeah, because they can't sell their bonds anymore. It's like, it's, a, it's just bond markets tank, so they're going to try to launch their own coin. I think it's they're cool. ICO. Yeah, they're going to ICO. Yeah, the city of Berkeley is going to ICO. That's right. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to like let it be on the public market, like where the price can be bid up and down, or whether there'll be a fixed rate, like a central issuer says, like a city of Berkeley bond is only going to be one dollar forever. Paul, are you going to short Berkeley? Is that what you're saying right now? I don't. I don't think they should. Uh, no, I don't, I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but also um, back to the decentralization for a moment. There, um, there are in addition to. Um, the like super specific usage tokens, there are also coins for people who do still want to mine on their own. Like that's like a specific benefit of those or coins for people where it's not just the developers who decide to make decisions about the direction that the coin should go in. It can be every holder of a coin. Um, and then uh, Paul kind of touched on this, but the uh, decentralized applications referred to as dApps, um, you can kind of like look at dApps that are being developed or dApps that exist and there are also decentralized exchanges. So it seems like for every uh, concern that has been raised, people are trying to work to solve it, to at least give people the option to stay away from feeding into the hands of whales. I mean, uh, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said, and I also feel like there's definitely legitimate reasons to be critical of cryptocurrencies, and some of them you just laid out, and you know the environmental concerns also. Um, I don't know. Our team, I think, remains highly skeptical of this kind of thing. Although I am personally interested in, um, you know, encoding certain things like uh, uh, keeping people from accumulating too much wealth or something into the system would be an interesting idea to combat uh, rampant capitalism. Um, and uh, in any case, for something like bail block, it's a kind of a temporary determinant of, uh, you know, the speculation. So it's kind of, we're able to remain skeptical and sort of take advantage of the system to get a couple people out on bail in the meantime. And what I like about it most is that you're, it's bail block becomes um, like a flag planted, you know? Like now that it's done, it, it, you know it works, like someone else can come along and think about it as a, as a variation, you know? But to, just the fact that it exists means that you've put a stake on the ground to say that this is possible within the world of crypto, as opposed to the next shit coin that you make that you think you're gonna raise a zillion dollars on, you know? And there can be more of these projects. And I think it would perhaps encourage other, perhaps more other-minded people to be involved in crypto. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you for the clear uh, introduction to crypto and for the inspiring stories. And I'm really uh, interested or I, I'm fascinated by uh, this 
political and economical agency provided by distributed ledger technologies, but I'm particularly curious about how to implement this into the art world. So how could we decentralize the art world? Because as a curator, I see it's a very traditional model, like um, white capitalist. So I think there is a great need to actually uh, implement uh, this technology into the art world, and what would be your points to add to this? I have something that I'm really worried about in terms of uh, implementing cryptocurrency and, and those sorts of principles uh, into the art world, which is um, I'm seeing this trend where people are using the blockchain as a means of uh, creating you know, authenticity or, or inscribing aura onto digital objects. And part of what I find so interesting about the internet is that it's just, everything is copy, 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 you know, download the movie, torrent, like whatever. It's just, if it exists here, it, it can't be stolen, it can only be copied. Um, and there's this kind of this movement to create like additions of digital artwork by like giving them, you know, these IDs that are immutable and then you could like sell that thing or someone can own the gun that was used in like a Counter-Strike match to win, you know, a tournament or something. Um, and so for me, I'm actually like really afraid of this because I like this sort of like post-scarcity movement. So I hope that the art world doesn't focus on that aspect of sort of monetization. Yeah, but I'm curious about how to go beyond of the only like smart contracts, like basically to, to introduce this political agency into the art world meaning decentralizing the art word. Well, you could, you could make an art object that had a smart contract written that was like, you know, if the owner of this art object doesn't, you know, divest from fossil fuels or something, then uh, the, it'll, it'll explode or... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, uh, the person who mentioned the story that was embedded um, when the, um, I, I mean, I don't know the specific case, but the idea that you could upload something through transactions into the blockchain and that anybody who's running a node has a download of this story, this artwork, this text. I think that there are possibilities to create um, your own blockchain that people can download and anybody who can download it can own the artwork. But I'm not an artist, so I can't um, think of too many examples beyond that, but I can think of a lot of uses for smart contracts in an art world which uh, thrives on like collectors and galleries. Um, wanting to protect secrecy and how artists might be able to benefit from participating in contracts from the beginning um, so that they can have an element of transparency while still concealing some part of the exchange. That Chinese story is, is actually much more, much more pertinent now than I think about it because the reason why the writer embedded the message in the blockchain was to get around censors that that was the only way he or she could get around the censors, because if he or she posted it just online, it would just be censored from on, on Chinese version of Facebook or whatever. So that's why they post, that's why they embedded the metadata post in the blockchain, to get around the, the, the official censors. And so that already, to me, connects to a, a new avenue of expression and political organizing, because the censors have not gotten smart enough to be able to censor the blockchain transaction yet. Josh, did you have something? This is a comment. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the most promising things about Bitcoin, and it's talking um, to whoever in the back was talking about Bitcoin as a pyramid scheme or crypto as a pyramid scheme, which in some ways some of them are. But what, one of the things that's promising about cryptocurrency is that it's um, deflationary. And so unlike the banks, which do this magic economic act called quantitative easing and like just keep making more and more money, devaluing what's in our bank accounts so that like, you know, a bottle of water was like, 
50 cents in 1999 and is now 250 in 2018, you know, and the pay doesn't necessarily go up at the same rate. Um, with crypto, it tends to go up, it tends to be worth more over time. So like, you know, I know a lot of people who are in precarious kind of forms of work and they put money into crypto and then it gains in value and then they're able to pay for like surgery or, you know, major life things. Which isn't to say that that's open to everyone, but it's just to say that it is a promising alternative to the current system that we have right now, in some cases. Hi. Um, also, as an alternative to the current system that's on the screen, um, there's a new nonprofit called Blockchain Terminal that's doing a uh, a kind of open source version of that for trading all kinds of, of like a Bloomberg's crate? Yeah, basically oh. like, a, like a terminal. And then there's a hardware component that's like a hundred bucks. So you can just like take it with you. Uh, just kind of interesting. I saw it today, but um, I was, I was wondering if, if you guys, especially like bail bonds, when you guys had um, the donation bar in your chart, were there, were there other charitable organizations that are starting to see the idea of supporting nonprofit like art groups as a, as a way of extending that, that general direction of democratizing blockchain? I mean, I know UNICEF, a couple, like uh, two months after we released it, I think came out with their own distributed crypto mining thing to raise money. Yeah, Slate was also sort of like covertly um, getting people who were browsing their site to do mining, which is, a more sinister version. Um, yeah. <laughs> We've spoken to a number of groups who are interested in doing this for various causes and various places on earth. Uh, and, you know, sort of given them our blessing to like take the code, which is all open source and vettable and, you know, do what they will. Yeah. Also, I mean, I guess that brings in like the legal question. Like there's a lot of crypto law stuff that's still not figured out and it can be pro a problem for nonprofits if they're getting, I don't know. Do you remember what percentage it is of 5% if they're getting more than 5% of their donations through crypto? Um, and right now the new inquiry is accepting um, bail block money and it's only not really a concern for us because we've always been a little bit scrappy and we don't think that anyone's going to try to test crypto law on us. Um, but I can imagine that being an impediment for uh, nonprofits that are, are trying to do fundraising through um, distributed mining. Last cheeky comment. Um, do you ever think of doing like the flip side, like raise money to send white collar bankers to jail? <laughs> um, it's a it's a nice idea. Unfortunately, we don't want jails to exist at all. So, Wait, how would that work? You would <laughs> yeah, raise how, money, uh, yeah, but then you would you would hire a, like an enforcer, or how would that? How, wait, I guess how would we'd that work? like we'd have to have our own um, investigative team. Yeah, investigative team. Also, who feeds like a them? Who feeds the team. info to the NYPD or something? Or yeah, or the SEC, we're really not actually, trying to the collab SEC. with them. But <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I made a game called Launch a Banker that you might enjoy, <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like. Banned from iTunes? Yeah. You should tell them. Tell them about the, the game. Well, you just shoot a banker out of a cannon and try and land them in a distant jail cell of sorts. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Money flying out of his pocket. It's good. But it was banned. Yeah, they wouldn't let it on the App Store because it was too violent. <laughs> I think it'd be cooler if we could just like hack hack the white collar criminals. I don't really care what like if Wait, they're. Wait, what in does a... that mean? What oh, do you mean? I like, just mean go on their Gmail account. <laughs> oh well, we. Oh, uh, I guess there was some idea. I don't know if I don't. It's probably not going to happen, so it's probably okay to talk about. There was some idea. This is like a totally different form of hacking that doesn't involve money, but like of getting. Um, uh, uh, somehow hacking like the Google calendars of venture capitalists so that they miss all their meetings. Uh, what was that? With oh, with Alexa. Okay. Stay tuned. I, I think that's called malware. 
So I, you just you're just basically you just want to make malware, yeah, which I mean, I'm all for. I love malware. I, I probably, think it's a good idea actually. Yeah. I probably shouldn't say this either, but I'm still confused as to why we haven't made bail block malware. Like why why haven't we just made it like a virus? <laughs> we get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> My, but like, how much money would we raise before we get in trouble? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, this is probably not the, not the venue for this. Don't, you don't have to admit it here in public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think you are. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have the technical jobs to do that. But. Uh, what did you mean by the aesthetic of cryptocurrency? Who said that? Um, in your presentation, you were talking Mine. about the aesthetic of cryptocurrency. Uh, uh, I don't remember, to tell you the truth. I think, um, <laughs> at first blush, I think it might be connected to what I think is the conceptual elegance of the system. Um, that a, a system that maintains itself and incentivizes its own maintenance and to get other people to maintain it as a store of value is, I think, a beautiful idea. It's, it's, it's just a beautiful idea. <laughs> And, uh, and so maybe at first blush, that would be an aesthetic of it. Um, and, you know, pro I'm not a programmer, and so I can't tell you what the code looks like. But, uh, you know, I'm a publisher, and I know writing. And, you know, programming is not unlike writing. And I think there's elegant code that you can, you can recognize. I mean, yeah. it, right? For sure. And, um, and I, can't rec I can't read the code, but just how it works, I think, is incredibly elegant. It's, there's, this, there's, this, there's like an austerity and an elegance to it that I really appreciate. That, um, above and beyond, I mean, um, not even talking about the financial speculation and its use, use and its use, just the idea of it, I thought was wonderful. So, and I think maybe beyond that, that, um, I think if other kinds of people were interested in crypto, perhaps the aesthetic, perhaps what we can bring to the table is another sensibility, not purely through financial speculation and money grubbing, but perhaps use it for another purpose, which is just another story of what it can be used for. But that takes vision and it takes a different kind of aesthetics. It takes, it takes a kind of idea of what beauty is above and beyond uh, greed, I suppose. Right, or primitive accumulation for an academic term for it. Yeah, I think, of, like Paul said, I think the aesthetic is more organizational or abstract. Some people think the US Constitution is a beautiful design that has lasted, you know, it has its flaws, uh, you know, it has like slavery built into it, so that's not great. But it's, uh, you know, it's a big experiment, and I'm sure no one expected it to last this long, like 200 and something years. So, in the same sense, you could design a beautiful coin that. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has held up amazingly well, and I'm sure many people thought it would tank by now. Um, so it's beautiful in that sense to me. Hey, thank you for your presentations. They were very great. Um, I'm someone who very recently found myself with a little bit of savings, um, and last year I decided to put it into Ethereum not knowing anything about it at all. Um, also someone Good who move. is a child of non-English speaking immigrants that grew up low income, so no one in my family or where I grew up has any idea about any of this. Um, I'm kind of thinking, you know, you guys are artists, you're writers, where in your wildest dreams do you envision this, you know, 10, 15 years from now? Like the whole crypto ecosystem coins, everything, especially your glorious outfit. I forget your name, but I feel like you probably have some wildly imaginative kind of ideas about where this might be going. Well, you know, I, I, I will start. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I, I would love it to basically abolish money. You know, the whole reason, you know, once you have a ledger like this and then, so, you know, we live in a, we ha the world produces enough food and enough, enough of everything, and there's a problem, and there is a scarcity problem that the people that need the resources that there are abundance of do not get these resources. Um, and I think this is something that when we move away from sort of like an economic system that 
sort of traces itself back to gold or like treasure hoarding and into a system based on um, sort of like needs and wants, maybe embodied by the blockchain, then, um, you know, this is very like utopian, but, uh, you know, I, I, I would imagine a world where um, people are freed from sort of like basic wants for basic needs. And uh, right now we're talking about coins, but maybe, you know, in 100 years, no one's even, we're not even talking about coins and how much Bitcoin, you know, whales and not whales. You know, we're just able to like, you know, li you know all live lives, you know, you know like, like the American Constitution, you know, like, you know, um, you know life, liberty, and pursuit of, pursuit of happiness and not have to worry about sort of like basic, basic needs that most of the world has to worry about, you know, outside the US. Like I think that crypto can solve problems you know, you know, all can solve like things other than like our pretty bourgeois. Like I'd like to buy a bottle of water, whatever, maybe some ether. I think that it can solve these these grand, these large scale, pro like human problems. Anyway, hopefully. <laughs> I think there will be a whole lot of corporate coins and a lot of like state or country coins, and that will be awful. But I also think. Um, when Paul says that uh, crypto is a new form of leverage, there could also be a lot of protest that can happen with people joining together and taking on a form of economic protest through smart contracts, um, let's say against a company or against a country, people who don't have to be in the same place. Um, could hopefully use their money as leverage in a decentralized way. I'm with Miriam. I think one of the great hopes that I have about cryptocurrency, it provides a new form of collective bargaining. I think that will, I think that will do it. Um, <laughs> Thank you to everyone on stage. And uh, thanks for being here. Um, Meredith suits for sale. One so if you want to to her, and then we <laughs> have Badlands has stuff in the back. And uh, you know we're happy to talk to you. Maybe. I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone. Um, any case, thanks for coming. And uh, have a good night. <laughs>